We begin the book of Deuteronomy tonight. I'm excited. Deuteronomy, what an incredible book as we begin uh, just a whole new lesson. And, and I think what, it, what an incredible uh, practical book, the book of Deuteronomy is. Let, let, let me ask this. Did, did school start today for some? Tomorrow. Okay. That sounded exciting. So I'm like, tomorrow. <laughs> All right, tomorrow. All right. Praying for, I'll, Sunday, I'm going to pray for the teachers because they need more prayer than the students. So we'll, we'll, we'll lift up all the teachers on Sunday. Just ask for God to give them the strength to make it through the year. Deuteronomy chapter 1. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to open up there. I'm going to kind of lay out a, 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 just an a introduction, and then we'll look at the first chapter tonight. I entitled the message, Never Forget. I think it's such an important book, even though it reiterates much of what has already been said in the first four books of the Bible. Remember what we've learned thus far. We, 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 we've taken Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers now. We've got, we've got this is the last of the five books that is known as the Pentateuch. It's, it's the first five books of the Bible, and it's really the foundation for Judaism. And what, what, what's interesting as you come to this book is, is at this point, everything's been established. The children of Israel are aware of how it all started, the beginning, creation, the fall. We're we're aware of, of man's sin and depravity. We're, we've, we've seen how it leads to destruction. We, 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 we've covered the flood, right, in the book of Genesis. And, and then as you go from Genesis chapter 12, we see a man come on the scene by the name of Abram, whose name is changed into Abraham. And it's through the lineage of Abram that the children of Israel are birthed, they're born, how they come into existence. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob has a son by the name of Joseph who goes into Egypt and he is there to rescue his brethren. Seventy of them go in. By the time 400 years passes is when you finally get to the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel are delivered out of the slavery and the bondage that had come. Joseph, you know, dies and generations pass. And pretty soon they don't even know who Joseph is or who the children of Israel are. And they start to treat them very harshly. And now they become slaves because they're multiplying so rapidly. And for fear of them becoming more powerful than the Egyptians, they put them into bondage, into slavery. And for 400 years, they're there. And then God hears their cry. And he delivers the children of Israel out of the hand of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's hand. And God does, in order to do so, some miracles. I mean, he, he, the plagues that come upon Egypt. And God defeats the greatest power on the face of the earth, Egypt. They had chariots and they had armies and they had, you know, all, all of the modern weapons. And yet here's this, this slave group of people that are able to overthrow them and overpower them. And, and they are set free and they go out over the Red Sea and they go into the wilderness. And we're going to find out tonight it was only an 11 day journey to go to the promised land. And for 40 years, they wandered. For 40 years, they went in a circle because they wouldn't walk by faith. They wouldn't trust the Lord. And so this, this, this as we come to chapter one of the book of Deuteronomy, it's, it's interesting because it's here that God is gonna be talking not to the first generation, but the second generation. Everyone in the first generation, 20 years and older, has died except for Joshua and Caleb. 
And now it's all of the 20 years and younger when they had rejected to go into the promised land that are actually alive. And, and God is going to have to reiterate everything to this younger generation. What God, you know, you know what's interesting, guys, is that we're just one generation away from the church no longer existing. Just one generation. They think about 40 years past, and if our children don't embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what, what happens? Right? And it's, it's this generation who watched their own parents rebel against God, and now God is saying, you know what? Now you guys walk by faith. And, and that's going to be true of my children in 20, 30 years from now. I won't be here anymore. And, and they're going to have to choose, you know, who am I going to serve? And, and it goes on from generation to generation. And then the great thing is, is that for the last 2,000 years, man, the church has always maintained. It's always sustained. Because there's always a group of people that God begins to pour out his spirit into and he begins to move in. And that's this generation here. God is, God is going to do incredible things. This is the generation that's going to go into Jericho and defeat Jericho. This is the generation that's going to take all the land of the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Termites and all those guys. He just, he's, <laughs> he's going to wipe them all out, right? And, and it's, this is the guys that, that are going to have great victory. But before they do that, before they ever get to this point, God is going to talk to them on a personal level. And, and the reason I love the book of Deuteronomy is because it's the first time, the first time that God begins to explain to the children of Israel why everything's come to this point. He, he's, he's really going to tell them uh, how much he loves them. Guys, in the first four books, the word love is only used seven times. In this book, it's used over 25 times just in the book of Deuteronomy. And every time it's used up until this point, it's never been God expressing his love for man. It's always been God telling man to love him or expressing a, a love for a wife or a love for a child. This is the first time that God is now telling them why he's done everything that he's done up until this point. And so God expressing his love to his people here in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and I, think, I think it's the theme, it really is, of, of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to find it over and over and over again in this book as God is telling them, guys, you need to, the reason you're in the position you're in is because I love you guys. That's what he's, he's going to keep telling. But I, I want to take you through this just, just because I think it's so important to the theme of the book. Watch Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse 37. Is, let, let, let me tell you why all this is happening. Tell you why God brought you out of Egypt because he loved your fathers. God, God has a great love for you guys and for, you, for their children, for the descendants that would come after them. God, this is all about God's love. In, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be where? In your heart. You see, God is expressing not only his love for them, but their in return love for him. We love God because he first loved us. This is, this is a re response to what God has done in our lives. It's our now acknowledging God loves me. And, and that's the message of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God demonstrated his love. And in response to God's love, we love him back. And so the book of Deuteronomy is going to constantly be bringing up that thing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look at the 6th verse. I right? think this one's just, uh, just incredible. Watch what he says. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look at the 6th verse. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all the people. But because the Lord loves you. 
And because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations and those who love him and keep his commandments and repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, the judgments which I command you today to observe them. No, no, notice what, and think about the whole picture, guys. God's saying this is a relationship. This is a relationship between you and God. And God's demonstrated his love for you. He chose you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It wasn't because you were greater or more powerful or any deserving. It's because God loves you. That's it. And in response, you love him. And when you do that, then, then you receive what? The blessings of God upon your life. But if you choose to rebel against him and, and, and you know, to disregard everything that he says to you and now, you know, not wanting to, to follow his truth, then God's going, right, then, then, you, then you're putting your back toward me and you become my enemy because it's about love. And so he establishes, look, look at Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 10, look at verse 12. I mean, over and over, man, just incredible. Deuteronomy chapter 10, look at the 12th verse. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Notice chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments always. Deuteronomy chapter 30, look at verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Guys, the whole idea of circumcision is cutting away the flesh. And, and he's saying, let me tell you something. God is going to do the work in your life, man, if you'll just allow him to. He'll be the one who brings you to this place. Look at verse 16, the same chapter, chapter 30. And then I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. And then Deuteronomy chapter 30, look at verse 20. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the strength of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So it's incredible because I had mentioned earlier, this is the first time in, in, in the, the first um, you know, five books of Moses that God now is expressing why he's done everything. It was because he loved them and because he wanted them to love him and he wanted a relationship between the two. And so it's here that all the things get established. There's a couple key words that, that you're gonna find as we're going through the book. You're gonna find the word um, to inherit the land, to possess the land, to hear and to hearken. Now, now to, the, the word land is used 153 times, to inherit 36 times, to possess 65 times. Because all of this is, is about God now fulfilling the promise that he gave them. I'm, I'm, he's promised them the land and they're going to inherit all of this land that God's given them. And so you're going to find those words over and over again. This is about them going into the promised land now. And then we're also going to find the word love 25 times. And then we're going to find the word heart 46 times in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and you kind of, you from, you know, just kind of these, these repetitive words that you find in this book, you kind, you kind of get the whole picture that God is, is laying out for them that if they would love him, that he would in turn bless them. And loving him meant obedience. Guys, whenever you love God, you, that is expressed through your obedience to God. 
You can't say, I love God, and then rebel against him, right? Loving God is, is expressed by your surrender to him and your obedience to him. And so that's exactly what the children of Israel are going to discover as the book of Deuteronomy is Moses. Now, remember, Moses now is in his latter days. He, he's ready to die. He's, you know, at the end of his life. He's not going to go into the promised land. What we're going to find out is that they're now in uh, Kardish Barnea, which is the last place they would go before they enter into the promised land. And so they're gathered together there. And it says, it's, this is really Moses' last sermon. This is Moses' last opportunity to instruct the children of Israel. He had been for, you know, for 40 years in the desert. And then for 40, you know, for, and that, that was after he had fled from Egypt. And then for 40 years, he had been in the wilderness. And so he now is going to instruct the children of Israel that are about to go into the promised land. And so he, he's going to lay out all of this. The book of Deuteronomy, the, the, in the Greek, it literally means the second law. The word Deuteronomy, the second law. It's not a different law. What it is, is it's the second time Moses is repeating it to the next generation now. So, so it's, it's laying out for us much of what we've already learned, but I think here it's going to be given in a practical way on an everyday life, how to live it out, not just this is what you do and don't do, but this is how you do it. He's, he's going to give us some very clear instructions to practical obedience in the book of Deuteronomy. That, that's why I, I think, again, I, I think if you're looking at the first five books of Moses, you come to Deuteronomy and it's the most practical of all the books. All, everything else has been telling us, you know, all, all the do's and the don'ts. Now Deuteronomy is telling us, okay, this is how you do it. And so he's going to, we're going to, we're going to see some very practical um, lessons in the book of Deuteronomy. The first 11 chapters of this book is going to be looking backwards. He's going to give them a history lesson right off the bat. He's going to tell them, look what your fathers did and learn from their mistakes. That, 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 that's, a, that's a great lesson, isn't it? To learn from somebody's mistakes. I, I, I love it when I can learn from somebody else's mistakes so I don't have to make the same ones. Right? <laughs> That, that, that's wisdom. When you, you know, I, I wish I could say I do that more often than I do. I usually have to learn the mistake myself, right? And then I go, oh, man, I should have listened. <laughs> I should have I watched what happened over there because I wouldn't have to go through this myself. What, what, what Moses is trying to do is say, look what happened to your fathers. And if you would learn the lessons, you won't have to experience the same consequences that they experienced. And so the first 11 is looking backwards, for chapter 12 to the end is looking forward. And so we'll, we'll be working our way through that. It's interesting that Moses is aware he's not going to the promised land and Joshua is gonna take over. The whole leadership position is gonna be handed over to Joshua. Joshua becomes a type of Christ because Christ is the only one who can take you into the promised land. Moses, the law, can only lead you to the border. <laughs> it can't get you in. And so what, what the whole picture is, is that Joshua his, what is really the same name in the Greek, Jesus, and what is gonna happen is that Joshua is gonna be the commander in chief to get him into the promised land. And so he's aware, you know, what? It's I, Moses isn't going to, you know, I'm not going to take you guys in. Joshua's going to take you in. But it doesn't matter who the leader is as long as you're obedient to the Lord. That's what he's going to teach them. Obedience to the word of God. That, that's the most important lesson. And he's going he's to reiterate that over and over. They were going to face new challenges as they entered the promised land. And they needed to be grounded in the word. You know, any time you're going to face challenges in life, man, if you would take this book and just say, okay, God, whatever challenges I'm going to face, I'm going to get the instructions that you would say concerning this situation, and I'm going to obey them, man, you would have success in life. 
But if you face those new challenges and you try to do it in your own wisdom or in your own power or your own strength, I mean, you're, you're going to have to constantly go through, a, through defeat. And so God's going to teach them, look, if you just obey my word, as you guys go into this new land, this new territory, this new position that you're going to go into, man, you're, you're, you're going to have great success and you're going to be blessed beyond measure. And so he's, he's going to lay all of this out to them. Let's begin chapter, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 1. Watch this. These are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite Suf between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hezeroth, and Dizahab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, in the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them. After he had killed Sion, king of the Amorites, and dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt in Ashtaroth, in Adrael. On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying. Now, he's given us some, a, a lot of insight here already. When they came out of Egypt, the first place they went to was Mount Seir, we also known as Mount Sinai. And they had made their way all the way to Mount Sinai, and it was there that they received the Ten Commandments. And from Mount Sinai to go into the promised land was only an 11 day journey. And what God is telling, what, what Moses is telling them, and as he's speaking on behalf of God, is look, guys, I want you guys to learn the lesson because remember what had happened. That 11 days turned into 40 years. 40 years. You didn't have to go around the mountain 4,000 times. <laughs> If you would have just listened to, if your fathers would have just listened to the Lord, you mean you, you guys would have been in the promised land, you would have been raised in the promised land, and don't make the same mistake, and that your children would be able, what, to now reap the benefits of the promised land. And so he, he really, you know, very clearly said, look, I, I want you guys to understand this. Here we are 40 years later, which should have only been 11 days. And what's incredible is that Moses now is going to lay out all of these things. They had been through all kinds of battles already. They had already fought against the king of Sion and the Amorites, uh, the king of the Amorites and Heshbon and Og, king of, the, of Bashan. You know, they, they had already experienced battles. But none of those battles were necessary if they would have went straight to the promised land. They would have fought the battles that were necessary. And, and I think there, there's a lot there, guys, for us. You know, you, you, you can go around the mountain and fight all kinds of battles, but you're never going to get where God wants you to be unless you're going to obey. And he's going to talk about the life of faith here. He's about the life of, of trusting the Lord, of obeying God, willing to, to put it all on the line. And, and I, I think too often so many Christians like to live right on the, on the other side of the Jordan when the promised line is accessible to us if we would just be willing to trust the Lord. We just kind of hang out right there going, man, it would be nice to live in the promised land. It sure would be nice if I was living the victorious Christian life. And, but we just kind of, I'm not willing to really walk by faith. I'm not willing to trust the Lord. I'm not willing to obey what God says. And so really the whole instruction here is, look, you don't have to live there anymore. You can walk by faith now. You can just begin to live a life of confidence in the things that God says. And when you do so, your circumstances will change. Not that you're not going to have battles. The first thing they do is they get to Jericho and they got a, a battle. And then as soon as they get done with that battle, the next battle, and then the next battle. But this time they were winning the battles rather than, you know, winning the battles on, on this side, but never ever entering into the place of rest. Never having success. And God was wanting to change their course here. Notice what happens as we begin verse 
6, watch, watch what Moses tells the children of Israel. This is a reminder. Watch what he says. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough on this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountain of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, in the lowland, and south on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Watch this. To give to them and their descendants after them. You see, God is saying, look, God had already given the land to you guys. All you had to do was obey him. All you had to do is now, you know, enter the land and watch God rout the enemy for you. And it wasn't something you earned. And did you notice what he said there in, the, in verse 8, the very end? To give them to their descendants after them. It, it was a gift. All you had to do was enter the land just like God had already promised. Just do what God told you to do and, and everything's going to be fine. But the, the problem was is that they didn't want to obey. And I can tell you, everyone standing on the other side of the Jordan is in that same position. You don't want to walk by faith and so you just stay on the other side of the Jordan and you do it out of fear. Rather than obedience and confidence. And the, and the children of Israel, and, and Moses is going is to address that, and he's going to talk about his own failing. And, and, I, and I love that Moses puts himself in the very same situation or the same circumstance, because what Moses is going to tell the children of Israel, look, man, this is all about faith. This is all about faith. Guys, I understand something. Your Christian life, it's about faith. Do you really trust the Lord? And when God says something, do you believe that he's saying it for your benefit or you think that God's somehow trying to hold out on you? When God tells you, you know, what right is, he's telling you because he wants you to benefit from it. He wants you to be blessed. But oftentimes we think, well, well, you know, why doesn't God want me to do that? I want to do that, and I want to have fun, and it'll be fun to do it. And then what happens is that then we suffer the consequence of our sin. And their sin was that they weren't willing to trust the Lord. And Moses is going to lay this out for them. Look at verse 9, man. Incredible. Watch what he says. And I spoke to you at that time. Now, now remember, the only one alive here is Jacob and Joshua. I'm sorry, Joshua and Caleb are the only two that would have remembered this. All the rest of them have only heard the stories because all the rest have already died off. And when he's telling them, I spoke to you, he's telling them, I spoke to your parents, to your, to your descendants. Some of them that were 20 years and under may have remembered it, but there was very few of them, right, 40 years later. And no, notice what he says. I spoke to you guys. And I said to you, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you here. You are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. Now, what we do know that is that there were 650,000 fighting men at this point. That means the army was 650,000. It's believed that there's close between two and three million people at this time. If you have 650,000 men 20 years and, and older, I mean, you, you count all the, the wives and then the children underneath them, you know, you, you, you got a number up in the, you know, 3 million range. And all of them are on this side and he, he's saying, look, look what God has done. Even though a whole generation has died off, God has multiplied you guys. And not only that, Watch what he says. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. 
How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise understanding and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me, and you said, the thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, the wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. And I commanded your judges at that time, saying, hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with you. You shall not show partiality in judgment, and you shall hear the small as well as the great, and you shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring it to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time, all the things which you should do. Now Moses is, is bringing back to the remembrance. Like, do you remember when, when we had established a nation that, you know, I realized after a while there was Jethro, his father-in-law told him, Moses, the thing you're doing is not good. You're trying to be the judge for this whole group, millions of people, and it's, you're gonna kill yourself. And they're gonna, you're gonna kill them waiting in line to, hear, to be heard. So what we're going to do is why don't you just make leaders of thousands and leaders of hundreds and leaders of tens and then what you'll do is you'll, the, you teach them the law and then they go out and they now execute it. Now, there was to be no favoritism. There was to be no, uh, no exceptions. There was no, there was no loopholes. There wasn't, you know, well, that was my uncle so he can get away with it. It, it, it wasn't... You know, everyone, everything was to be on the up and up. That, you know, can you imagine if we had a, a system of law that was on the up and up today? <laughs> what a different society we would have. If, if there was just, you know, just a straight across the board, you know, legal system that, that wasn't, you know, having prejudice or, or, or you know, favoritism or, or because you know somebody or because you're, Auntie's on, you know, a judge or, you know, just, it was just on the up and up. And, and, and this is what Moses said, look, you're doing it on God's behalf. And because you do it on God's behalf, you need to understand something. It's got to be done righteously and it's got to be true. And Moses had established that in the children. And he's reminding them, look, this is how we had established and it was important that the next generation also knew these things, right? It was important that, you know, think about our generation, guys, a generation that has forgotten God. That's, that's the generation we're living in, a generation that's forgotten God. And it's incredible because when I'm talking to young people now, you know, you can't just assume that they know who Moses is. You can't assume that they know who Joshua is or they know who Samson is. Or, you know, and, and there was a time when you can just make that assumption in, in our society, in our culture, that everyone knew at least the foundational things about the Bible. That's not the case anymore. It's crazy because like someone, you know, I'll, I'll teach and one of the young guys, a teenager, come and say, you know what, well, who, who was that guy you're talking about? And you got to go through the whole, you know, story so that they have a foundation under their, under, you know, their, their understanding. And this is what, what Moses is doing. He goes, look, guys, you need to understand these things. This is how it was established. We're, we're going to deal righteously, and then there's going to be leaders, and there's going to be leaders of the leaders, and there's going to be leaders of those leaders, and then if anything is, a, 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 you know, re really hard, then, then, then I'll intervene. And then, you know, this is how the, the, the the kingdom's going to be established. And I love what he said in verse 17. He says, you shall not be afraid in any man's presence. That you're not to be a respecter of persons. Or are you to fear man? The fear of man will bring a snare. Anytime we're more fearful about what people think about us rather than what God thinks about us, man, it's always going to be a snare to you. And so we need to be more concerned about what God thinks than what man thinks. And, and you know, this whole political correctness that we're, you know, we're, we're living under, you gotta ask yourself, man, am I gonna be a man pleaser or am I gonna be a God pleaser? Am I gonna be what, what everyone, what society says is, is what right is or am I gonna say what God says what right is? 
right? And, and that, that's going to be a question that we all have to, are going to have to deal with, man, because it's becoming more volatile in our culture right now. If you stand for righteousness, if you stand for truth, you're, you're labeled as a bigot or you're labeled as, you know, someone who isn't accepting or loving and you become the bad guy when you're standing on God's side. Think about that. When you have to become the bad guy because you agree with God. <laughs> isn't, that a, isn't that a sad commentary on our society? And yet that's exactly where we're at. And, and the children of Israel, man, were told, look, don't let man determine, but let God determine what right and wrong is. And then notice what he says in verse 19. Check this out. So we departed from Horeb. We went through all the great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way of the mountain, the Amorites. The Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you've come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God has given us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and you said to me, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way which we should go and the cities into which we shall come. The plain pleased, the plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed, they went into the mountains and they came to the valley of Eshcol and they spied it out. And they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and they brought it down to us and they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God has given us. Now, th th now th think about this. God had already told them it was the land flowing with milk and honey. God had already told them that they were gonna just prosper in the land they were going. And they, we need to send spies to see if God wasn't lying to us. You, always, you got a problem when you got to try to verify what God already told you to be true, right? And so we, we need to go, you know, we're going to send guys in there to make sure that God is really going to give us the land. And, and, and here, here, here's, here's, here's the deal. Watch this. Moses agreed with them to send the 12 spies. And Moses is acknowledging that that was part of his failure. Because he didn't trust the Lord. He goes, hey, that plan sounded good. That sounds like a good idea. We should do that. And Moses acknowledges, you know what? I blew it. Because if I would have just trusted the Lord and said, no way, guys. You, were, you know, we don't have to send spies in. God told us to go. We need to go. But because of his lack of faith, along with the lack of the faith of the children of Israel, they never entered the promised land. And that's why for 40 years they wandered. No, no, notice, look at verse 26. He says, nevertheless, you would not go up, but you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents, and you said, because the Lord hates us. He's brought us to the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are greater and fortified up to the heavens. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakin there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carried his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all of that, you did not believe the Lord your God. Wow. You, you want to talk about Moses putting it on thick. You know, you know, Moses going, let, 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 me just, let me just tell you guys how, what, what this is all about. God gave you every reason to trust him. He sustained you. When you were crying for water, he provided you water. When you began to cry for, for food, God provided you manna every day. 
Everything in your life that you needed, God provided for you. Your sandals didn't wear out. Your, you know, your, your clothes didn't, didn't you know, deteriorate for 40 years. You, you think God isn't able to take care of you? Really? And, and the, the, the problem that, that the children of Israel are dealing with is that they let fear control them rather than trust the Lord. They were worried about the consequences of obeying the Lord rather than the consequences of not obeying the Lord. And when you look at this passage, man, it, it blows my mind because one of the things that the children of Israel acknowledge is that their view of man was greater than their view of God. They saw the giants in the land. And they thought, man, there's no way that we can defeat the giants. But they forgot God. The God who had delivered them from Egypt, Egypt was a way greater power than these guys. And they had seen God deliver them. You know, anyone who tells me, well, if God were ever to speak to me, then I would believe him. Or if I just saw a miracle, then I would believe. No, you wouldn't. Because if you can't take God at his word, you're not going to believe. Think about this. The children of Israel saw all the miracles in Egypt. The plagues. The Red Sea part. The manna come down from heaven. And here they are right on the edge to go into the promised land. And they're going, those giants are big. Well, Wait a second, you just saw all the miracles back here and you don't think God can handle what you're facing up here? You gotta be kidding me. As this isn't a matter of needing evidence, this is a matter of not wanting to trust the Lord. That's what it comes down to. That's a hard issue. If you and I would just simply take God at his word, that, I mean, what would the Lord do in our generation, if we would just trust him with all of our heart. I can tell you, God has blown my mind. And, and you know, and, and, and let me, let me tell you, I'll just be straight with you guys. Convicted that I don't trust him more. Convicted that I don't take greater steps of faith. Every time we take steps of faith, man, God shows up and, and does a, just above what, what we can even imagine. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I told the story already. We, we, were, we, we started the school 11 years ago, the, the, the academy. And last year, we, we were um, at the point where we're thinking, man, you know, just financially, we were struggling. It was, we didn't know if we were going to make it another, another year through. through and, and we were actually praying, God, if you don't, if you don't provide by you know, a certain date, then we're just going to have to, we're just, we'd have no choice. We're going to have to close the school. And so we, it was one of those I, I, just gut-wrenching things for me. I, I, I know God wants the school to stay open, but I, I, you know, here I am lacking faith. And, and right two months before, we, we had kind of gave God his deadline. <laughs> God, if you don't do it by this day, that's it. We get, we get a phone call from someone I've, we've never met, I, to this day I've never met, and, and this, this, this lady wanted to put the school in her will. And our administrator went out and, and, and met with her, and, and she, uh, she says, you know what, I, I, I have, I have uh, you know, a million dollars, and I want, to, I want to donate it to the school. And we're just like, no way, you know, that, that's, that's not, not even, and, and, and so, so th this, is, this, this is the rest of the story. We, we're, we're going, all right, you know, whatever, we don't, you know, we don't, this woman could live another 20 years. I mean, how are we going to make it till this week? <laughs> and so Sh 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 Sean goes and meet, meet, meets with, this, with, this, with this lady, and uh, she goes, you know, I, I really want to give you guys this money, and she goes, matter of fact, you guys need money right now. How about if I write you a check for $100,000 today? That's exactly what we needed to get the school even, right? And so we're just going, 
all right, Lord, if, you know, and sh- sure enough, she writes, and then we're going, it's not going to, it's not, it's, it's going to bounce, right? It's, <laughs> it's, there's no way. And, and sure enough, man, $100,000 goes into the checking account. It, it, for, it, it covered the last 11 years shortage <laughs> of, of, for the school. And, and, and the, you know, we're just like, man, God, you, you just blow my mind. You, met, you gave us the exact amount of money. And she says, I, I, you'll get the other $900,000 when I die. She died a few, a week later, two weeks later, never met with a lawyer, and their other money never got into her account. <laughs> now, now I, I, it, you know, I laugh about it. I, I cried her later, but, <laughs> but here, here was the deal. God gave us what we needed. And he didn't want us to have to trust in anything else but him. And guys, th- I, I think that's where God always has us. Are you willing to trust him? You know, and, and every time we take a step of faith, we're like, all right, God, if, if you're going to do this, then we're gonna, if you tell us to do that, we're going to jump. And if, it, it mean, if, if we don't survive it, it then so be it. But we want to obey you in every arena that you put us in. And it just, it boggles my mind. When we moved into this building, guys, there was no way for us to pay for this building. And, and we were just like, I believe God told me to do it. And God, we moved into this facility with less than 200 people, part of this body. It, it didn't even make sense for us to be here. And not only that, we've, you know, in, in construction, we got over a million dollars worth of construction and we were now purchasing the building. And, and you know, just like God is faithful if we're willing to trust him. And, and when I get convicted is that sometimes, man, I, I begin to put my eyes on the circumstance rather than on the God that I serve. And the children of Israel are going to have to learn that lesson too. The, right here, they're in the middle of this, and they're, and they're going, man, we can't go into the promised land. How are we going to defeat the enemy? And how many times has God put things in front of you where he's asking you, just trust me. Just follow me. Just obey me. If you just obey me, watch what I'll do. And instead of obeying him, we walk around the desert for 40 years. Instead of trusting him, we just kind of stand on the border of Jordan and just kind of look into the promise and go, that would be nice, but I, I don't know. And God wants you to walk by faith. He wants you to walk in obedience. He, want, he wants you to trust him. And if you do it, he, he will never let you down. And he'll never fail you. And the children of Israel were having to learn this lesson. Remember what he said in verse 32? Yet for all of that, you did not believe the Lord your God. Even though all of this went down, you didn't believe the Lord. Because that, that's convicting. That, that's embarrassing. It's like, w- w- when did God ever fail that I can't trust him? And yet the children of Israel saw God do miracle after miracle, and yet they wouldn't trust him. This is a heart issue. And, and, it's, and it's, it's very practical. I, I can't tell me how many people come, come you know, and say, I want to put my kid in the school, but we don't have enough money we're walking by faith walk by faith too if God wants your kid here he's gonna you know he'll provide and I'm just saying that as a practical thing I'm talking about in every arena of life guys are we willing to trust the Lord if that's what God wants to do and and it's incredible because watch this and this this is crazy look at verse 33 you went in the way before I'm sorry, let me get verse 32 and 33 together because it, it, it doesn't sound right if it doesn't. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you, to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. This, this, this is what, what Moses is saying. Guys, God was leading you this whole time. God was leading you this whole time. He, he actually had a fire a pillar of fire that would lead you every night. And he would, you would have a cloud that would lead you every day. He led you all the way to, Bar, to, to Barnish, uh, um, what's the name of that place? Kardish Barnea. Not Barnea, Kardish. 
to Cardiff Barnett. He led you all the way there and then he takes you there and then you say, oh no, we don't want to follow you anymore. What? But look at this, look, look at this, man. Verse 34. And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry. And he took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give to their fathers. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephaniah, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I am giving the land in which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me. For your sake, saying, even you shall not go into the land. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there, and to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey in the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And you answered and you said to me, we've sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight just as the Lord your God commanded. And when every one of you had girded your weapon of war, you were ready to go to the mountain. And the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you should be defeated before your enemies. Wow. And no, no, notice what God is laying out for the children of Israel. Look, you guys wouldn't trust the Lord. And now, after you know, God finally gets angry with you, now you want to go and, and, and do what he told you to do. And, and what, what, what's amazing in, in this whole picture is that God is wanting them to trust him when it didn't make sense. Guys, God wants you to trust him when it doesn't make sense. Logically. But it makes total sense spiritually. Right? And, and, and the children of Israel, after they got rebuked by God, now they're going, okay, now we'll go fight. And God's going, no, it's too late now. You had your chance. Now, if you go and fight, I'm not going with you guys. Because really, this was, you know, it, it's, it's almost like the children of Israel are going, you know, whatever God says, we're going to do the opposite. <laughs> and how, how many times, man, do we find ourselves in that same position? Whatever God says, you know, I want to go the other way. God says, don't go. No, we're going to go now. You're supposed to obey the Lord. And they decide, we're going to go anyway. And look what happens. Look at verse 42. The Lord said to me, tell them, do not go lest you, defeat, uh, you be defeated before the enemy. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and presumptuously went out into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in the mountains came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. And he returned and you wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give you ear to you. So you remained in Kaddish many days according to the days that you spent there. Wow. Rebelled. You rebelled by not going in, and then you rebelled by going in. Right? <laughs> and how many times, man, you know, really, if you look at this whole thing, it was first one was the lack of faith, and the second one was the lack of obedience. And God is always looking for us to what? To walk by faith and obedience. You can't separate the two, right? No, now we're going to walk by faith. No, now you're rebelling against what I told you. And God is looking for a people that are willing to walk by faith, and in doing so, they're walking by obedience to the Lord. That's what he wants for my life, and it's what he wants for your life. Is that we would take, it, take him at his word, and when God says something, that we would be willing to listen and to heed and to obey and then to walk in the, in the midst of it, man. And when you do it, and this, this is the cool thing, God's teaching them this lesson so that when they go in, now remember, and, and we're still a long ways off, but remember their first battle, they go to Jericho. They get over, now this is incredible, because they get over the Jordan River 
As they get over the Jordan River, God says, okay, guys, none of you have been circumcised, so now we need to circumcise you guys. Okay, now, now you're, you're talking an army of 650,000 men. None of them have been circumcised yet. So they're now in enemy territory, and what does God tell them to do? Basically, go into the hospital for three days. Because you're not going to be able to fight anybody right after you're circumcised. I'll guarantee you that. Right? These guys are going to be down. <laughs> and what were they going to have to do? Trust the Lord. Obey God. Even though it didn't make sense to do so, they were going to have to obey the Lord by being circumcised before they ever went to their first battle. They, they recover. You know, I, I imagine they, they, they were there for a little while, kind of healing. God protected them that whole time. The enemy could have came and overtaken them. But, but here's the deal. Then God tells them, I want you to go to Jericho and I want you to walk around the wall every day for seven days. Doesn't that sound like a great military strategy? Go walk around the wall for seven days. That, I mean, that's really going to do incredible things. <laughs> You're like, walk around. Really? Seven days. Well, I was walking around the wall. And, and this, they weren't supposed to talk while they were walking around the wall. Complete silence. Seven days. On the seventh day, you're going to walk around the wall seven times. Now, now you know, walking around the wall seven times, now, I mean, again, not, not logical at all. You're going to be pretty tired. And on the seventh time, you're going to blow the trumpet and you're going to scream and the walls are going to come tumbling down and you're going to go and defeat the enemy. None of it was logical. It was all going to be by faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. And God is looking for a people that are willing to walk by faith and obedience. And when he finds them, man, now you're able to what? You're able to walk and have victory. And you're able to be in what? The place that God designed for you to be in. Walking with him. This whole book, guys, I, I'm excited because, because you know, just, we're just, we're just kind of scratching the surface. But, I mean, every one of the lessons he's going through, he's teaching them how to practically live a life of faith and obedience. That, that's that's going to be the lessons that we're looking at as we continue Deuteronomy. How to walk the life of faith and obedience to the Lord.